Uh, thank you very much for the, uh, Phil as well. Um, we're going to be touch, touching on quite a few different, uh, the, quite a few same points, um, except I'll be doing it in fairly conventional order instead of backwards. Um, one of the first things you've got to do is, uh, anybody who's over um, 40 has got to give you a history of computing, haven't they? So this is my first computer. Ultimately secure this thing. Um, it had no network lines, no um, input. Uh, half the time I couldn't even load programs myself, so it was very secure in that respect. Um, I went on to, um, on to university where they had honey ma Honeywell mainframes. Um, it took us less than a week to give ourselves um, full access to, uh, to the computers. Um, we were given a choice, either get sent down or uh, harden up the whole of their security system, which spent the next year doing so. Um, that was my first introduction to uh, security in any shape or form. <coughs> After that, I spent six years um, at Dell. Um, my real introduction to security in, in any real form was uh, Unix System 5. Um, but even then, it was mostly passwords and usernames. Um, not much beyond that. And even the networks we had, Netware 3.1, pretty much the same thing. The security really was quite lacking. So lacking, uh, you know, security, what security? Um, I've uh, been around since 94 consulting for other people after I left Dell. Um, life has moved on in IT, it's developed uh, somewhat, but there wasn't uh, really no uh, real great changes going on. And one of my other um, uh, Loves is just getting into uh, technology with small companies all the way up to FTs, actually spreading the experience around. So you see a lot of different areas and different ways people work. Obviously, the post-it notes on the one-man bands are pretty, um, pretty classic. Um, FT companies, actually not much better. Um, the other love I have in my life is uh, sailing around the world. Um, and in 2010, I took my latest trip. I thought IT had settled down, so I wasn't going to miss too much while I was away. And uh, obviously, while I was away, we had good old DevOps basically appeared on the scene, along with the cloud. Um, completely changed things. And it was a struggle, actually, to get back up to speed uh, this time around. Most times, I've been able to drop into it pretty quickly. Um, but the What's been happening over that period of time is we've gone from the good old bare metal that we used to use at Dell and sell lots of. Um, these took months to, uh, almost to uh, deploy. Uh, they were around for years. Um, so once you'd done security on those, it was done. We didn't have to do, think about it too much after that. But obviously they were inefficient, which is what we all know in the last few years. So we headed up to virtual machines after that. Um, virtual machines, not an awful lot different to bare metal, um, just makes the bare metal more efficient. But again, once they were deployed, they usually took, um, where well, you can deploy them in minutes if you use the right templates, uh, but they're normally around for weeks or years. So again, you're not having to think too much about security. Now we're moving into microservices or services with containers. Um, we're getting a lot more, so there's a lot more uh, attack vectors out there. Um, so you've got to spend a lot more time now looking at those various attack vectors. Um, so you're getting starting to be challenged, certainly on the op side of things, how you can start looking at that. I have to wait a bit for it. Essentially, we're moving on to um, onto microservices now, which is Lambda. They're up for 100 milliseconds, and then they die. Um, how you're meant to be you know, checking all those, and there's literally hundreds of these, if not thousands. So you've really got to, if you can't, also automate the way you approach security and capacity on these things, you're not going to be able to keep up on, on these things. So we've got to approach this in a different way. As I said, um, yeah, this book came out in 2010 as I left the country and transformed IT somewhat. But one of the interesting things about this book is it only mentions the root secure 44 times in the entire 400, 500 pages of the book. 
and 10% of that is actually in the index. So they weren't even thinking about security, but um, we do. So how does your security and what drives your security um, for in, within your organization? Um, when do you consider it? Um, Band-aid at the end, much like uh, Phil was saying. Um, you've got the whole thing rolled out. It's a logical place to start because how do you know what to test if it doesn't already exist and it's not already set up? Um, kind of, um, yeah, yeah, get there. Um, this is known um, in the old days as died in the piece. Um, when you were dyeing things back in the Middle Ages, dyes were very expensive. They looked at all different ways to um, reduce costs in these things. So rather than um, uh, waste the dyes, what they used to do is only make the entire garment and then dip, the, dip it into the dye at that point. Nice and cheap, saved on dyes, but as soon as you start getting any wear and tear, all the dye started coming off, you started seeing the colours underneath, the quality wasn't that good. You started you know, looking pretty shabby fairly quickly. The next one, uh, next place to consider it is your fit the system function test. You're doing your user test, you're doing uh, the functional test. Why not system function? Now, some people um, call this um, non-functional testing. It's a bit of a bet noir of mine that I like to squeeze. I consider you know, security capacity and uh, performance to be very much functional testing. So I'd rather describe these as a system function rather than non-functional. And this one, it equates to died in the yarn. Maybe. <laughs> We're gonna make up one here. Um, died in the yarn is where we've actually, won, uh, actually turned the, uh, the raw material into yarns. We dye it there. This gets better coverage of the yarns, so the quality of the product of the end garment stays better looking for longer. But it's still not ideal. You still have the same issues that you had with, um, with uh, dyed in the piece. So the last one is development stage. If you're putting all your efforts into making sure that the product you're producing is good from, the, uh, from day one, um, then you don't have to worry about um, all the other um, uh, uh, failures down the line, you're not wasting your time with your user tests and uh, the functional tests when it's going to fail on a security test right at the end. So all these tests need to go together and also you need to ensure that the code coming out to start with is not going to be um, uh, broken. And that was known as dyed in the wool. Some people uh, kind of um, make that synonymous with stick in the mud, which is probably quite appropriate for some uh, security people. Um, but actually, it produces the best quality. You get the, uh, the security baked in from the very beginning. So, um, touching a bit on what Phil was saying, we used to have dev and ops. Uh, likewise, like Phil, I used to um, do probably about 30, 40% devs. Now I'm probably coding about 20, 20 days a year. Um, mostly ops these days, but always um, because you're running ops systems, you need to keep those secure. It's your problem if somebody breaks into those. So we're adding in uh, SEC these days. And on top of that, I would also in, add in another part, which is both security related and operations. One of the projects I'm working on at the moment is rolling out um, uh, over 200 websites into Docker containers. Now we can produce you a, a container with Drupal, WordPress, Joomla on it within about four minutes. We can take about another hour to actually migrate your application across to the, uh, to the new platform. It then takes six or seven days for the networks team to do a five day SLA. Because they are so worried about their security on their fives, they won't let anybody program them. And it's really a lack of knowledge and a lack of um, faith in, in doing this. But doing these <coughs> things automated and programmatically means you're gonna make less errors with doing that. And we have all the information and we sit and watch the network guys 
literally cut and paste from our, in, uh, from our request ticket into their F5 and it really is nuts. So after the last uh, incidents, which was over 12 days to make one DNS change, they finally lost the battle and we are now going to be allowed to program their F5s. So I would say DevSec NECOPS is um, probably the title. I don't think that's going to be too catchy. So I do think uh, DevSecOps is uh, probably going to be around and, and probably needs to. People need to be reminded that that security needs to go in there from the beginning. So get security in from the start. Um, if you're doing the security uh, continuously, continuous integration, then you don't have to worry about being audited. There's so many companies I've been to out there that they get SOX compliance, PCI compliance, and, you know, oh my God, it's a big issue. What are we going to do about it? Now, have we got there enough resources? If you're already secure at the beginning, and you know that because the code you've been coming out with has been tested before it goes into production, you don't have to worry about the auditor. Yes, they'll come in. There's you know, ancillary parts of the ops, ops team that will have to worry. But the code and how, how it's being applied will already be um, addressed. So, one of the, um, the organizations that uh, Phil alluded to was OWASP. This started back in 2001. Um, they literally looked at uh, what was happening in, uh, in web coding and just how bad. And the classic one was um, SQL injection. The number of sites I used to go through and literally one equals one on the end of it, you're in with you know, full root access. Um, it was just too easy. So these guys actually got together and decided we needed to do something about it. So they were focused always on improving software security um, out on the web applications. Um, as Phil mentioned again, uh, they've got their OWASP top 10 and obviously take Phil up in his offer to get that poster. Um, well worth it. As he said, if you go through there and make sure you understand what's going on, um, and it's not limited to 10 by, by any means, but you will be starting to address you know, most of the major issues that are out there. As I said, the top one attack is SQL injection, and still these days there's so many sites you can just go out there and do most of the most simple SQL queries on them. Um, these are the, the 10, you can read through the slides later when, uh, when we send them out, but um, they are actually asking for 2016 security uh, requests to build the, the next top 10 for 2016. So that is a link on there, so if you want to go in there and add your own experiences into um, what's happening out in the wild, um, I'm sure they'll very much appreciate it. Another one that uh, also produced a list is the Cloud Security Alliance. Um, they had a um, notorious nine in 2013. They've just come out with their own one. It's now up to the treacherous 12. Um, so you can see there's still, you know, a lot of people have been pushing security and trying to get it fixed, but there's still an awful lot of work out there that uh, needs to be done from the start. Their number one a, uh, concern is uh, data breaches, and actually the data breaches primarily are coming from SQL injections. So they're pretty much hitting the same, same aspect. So onto Z-Attack Proxy. This was a, um, a flagship uh, project. It's their main project, and essentially it's there to try and attack all the websites. It's a white hat version, but obviously I'm sure the black hats out there are using it just as much because this is a great tool for going to find all those things. Um, it is an automatic web app penetration testing tool. It will, you just point your browser at it, it will go in through and spider your site. Uh, it works through a proxy and it will find all those hidden links you think nobody knows about. They're up there for, them, for the, um, the software to find. Um, it is good for both the beginners and advanced users. 
Um, it's probably the number one um, tool that's being used by professional um, uh, pen testers, but it is a very good front end that's simplified enough that uh, anybody gets value from it literally from you know, within the first 10, 15 minutes. You will go in there, put your own site in there, and within 15 minutes you will start getting back vulnerabilities in your site. And it's very quick um, without having to have an awful lot of knowledge behind it. It's had very wide support um, from all sectors of industry. It was a Google Summer of Code project to improve it um, a great deal. And also uh, the lead developer, a guy called Syme, he was actually employed by Mozilla. So they've been pushing it as well. So it, um, it's getting a lot of development and being kept up to date. Um, so the features. Um, one of the things, probably not a feature for some of you, it requires Java. Um, it is open source. You can go up to GitHub, look at uh, how they've coded it, what they've done for it, um, uh, make your own changes to it if you want to fork the uh, code. But it is fully open, so you can go in there and, uh, uh, and try it out. It incorporates other tools. Uh, Selenium is a web driver. So essentially, you put uh, scripts into Selenium, and you actually drive your websites. It's a classic one for just testing use of functionality in your websites. Because you are proxying for a Z-Attack proxy, then you can actually use um, uh, Zellium to um, uh, automatically regression test your sites. Um, I'll wait for that one to come up. It will come up, I'm sure. The other thing it has is it's fully extensible in much the same way as um, a lot of these things. Um, they've got a marketplace now, so you can actually write your own add-ons um, onto the thing. They're, they're removing some of the um, functionality out of the core to try and keep it light. So the port scanner now uh, used to be part of the standard product. If you don't need port scanning, because you only open up uh, one, two ports, four, four, three maybe, um, then uh, you don't need the rest of the port scanning. So you, that's a uh, plug on these days. Um, but you can, if you've got uh, the need to, you can write your own plugins for any Pacific testing. Um, it essentially has all that you need for um, uh, penetration testing. But, like all tools, it's not a silver bullet. There are lots of different tools that the hackers are using, and you should be doing the same. Why this is you know, one of the um, key ones, uh, there's others out there, Metasploit is one of the classics that a lot of people know about. Uh, you should be using those tools and any other, other tools you can think of, because the hackers are doing that for you. Delay here. Um, as I said, you can use it as a point and click tool. You can literally go in there, and I'll show you on the demonstration shortly. Uh, you can put in a, um, a website, click the button, and watch you go and get all the, um, the, the pages on the site first and uh, try some of the, um, the attacks, the basic attacks for, um, when it which means it's very good, as I say, you can learn this within uh, 15, 20 minutes and you can get value out of it once you've got it loaded up. Um, but it's also very useful for developers' quality <coughs> assurance. They can make sure that their code is correct. Um, if they've written something, they know about SQL instruction, of course they do. Um, but have they remembered to actually quote that statement this time? Uh, they can put this code in as soon as they submit code in a normal continuous deployment pipeline. Um, that code will go into Jenkins. Jenkins will fire up a Z attack proxy, and then you can come back and say, yes, it's worked, or no, you've forgotten to escape that statement. So it's also useful for learning about security. Um, it, it doesn't just tell you yes or no, it actually gives you full details about what's gone wrong, how the attack was actually formed, and also further uh, information about where to go and look for um, you know, providing better coding around these um, uh, the tools. So um, it's 
it's great as well as uh, being for professionals it's great for people learning um, the system to start with as I said a lot of uh, professional pen testers are now using this um, not as a, one of their only ones and, and why we talk about uh, being automatic, there's not, you can't do all of this automatically. You do actually start, have to start getting your hands dirty. Um, there's things like um, you need a log on to your site. Um, you can just get it to brute force that log on, but um, it's a lot quicker if you just go in there, do some manual um, browsing of the site. It will pick up that browsing because it's using session cookies, it knows about session cookies. It's also it's proxying all the content that's being sent there. So it will start picking up your site a lot quicker. And then you, when you do the attack, obviously you've got a lot more comprehensive attack from an end user point of view. Also, it's going through automatically clicking on links. So you, if you don't actually add the user credentials, which you normally have to do manually, um, it will click on the logout link and then it won't be able to test the rest of the site. So it needs to be able to log back in again a second time to go and browse the rest of the sites. Um, that feeds into doing the automation. So once you've uh, done some of this stuff, you can then um, uh, start automating. And they've got both uh, a full REST API, which you can use to program other tools to run Z, uh, Zap. And you've also got Z scripts in there. Zest scripts essentially take what you're doing with the um, with Zap, and they will uh, record those um, um, those functions that you're using. And it's the way they normally ask for you. If you've got any vulnerabilities, you would want to question with them. Uh, they ask you for a Zest script, so they can actually completely recreate what you were doing, rather than having to ask you to document all these steps. Um, Continuous integration, we'll be going on to more, but essentially what we can do is proxy regression tests. Um, regression tests is where you just have a standard set of tests, and every time you put your code in, it runs through those standard tests, so you know your content has not been affected by the latest change. And uh, because that's going through um, the proxying, we can um, automate that very quickly. It also has a plugin within Jenkins so um, uh, you actually run this from Jenkins. It, has a, uh, it fires off um, Zap from within Jenkins and can run all the functions of uh, Zap. So you can get um, the same scanning, the spidering of the site, uh, the reports, and all the rest of it that comes out of that plugin. As I said before, it works through a proxy. So what you do is just uh, go into your browser. You set it for um, normally local host um, 8080 as the standard. And then it's watching all the traffic that's going through, um, through that proxy. Uh, it has active and passive scan. So a passive scan is uh, where it just goes through and spiders the site. So it will look for all the links on your site and just go through and f finds those links and uh, adds them to the, um, to the uh, list of known uh, pages. The active one is where it will actually start trying to attack those, um, those links. So if you've got logon pages, you've got um, uh, forms, even if they're hidden forms, they're not hidden to, uh, uh, to a proxy, they can find them <coughs> quite easily and it will go through and attack the sites very quickly. You also don't need to use it through the UI at all. You can use it in headless mode, which is what the uh, Jenkins plugin does. Um, that goes through and just runs it from the API. So if you've got your favorite uh, tools like Apache Ant or something that's running your Java app, then you can then use um, the same tools to use the API and get the content out. Um, again, as Phil uh, alluded to, there are penetration testing sites. Um, these help you to get up to speed on some of the security flaws that you see. Um, uh, the obvious ones are command execution and um, injection, but there's many more. Uh, one of the major ones is um, Damn Vulnerable Web App, which uh, I love the name. 
Some people who don't like the swearing actually said deliberately, but uh, it's actually known as damn vulnerable. Um, it's literally got a site. It's got different levels of security that it puts on there. You go and choose your level of security um, and then start your testing in there and to see um, how good um, the, the attacks are. It's a great way to learn what the attacks are and how vulnerable some of these sites are. The other one is Bodge IT. This is actually written by uh, Simon, the lead developer on uh, Zap. <laughs> um, and it's literally, it's another version of uh, a vulnerable web app. It's got all the holes and security flaws in there for you to go and find. See, so just uh, run these up, point at uh, Zap at it, and see uh, the, the different um, scenarios. You can then go and look at the code and see how you can fix it. So it's a great learning tool to ha see how to improve some of, the, some of the errors that are happening there. Another one, as I said, uh, mentioned earlier, was Metasploitable. Um, this one um, uh, hasn't got a uh, Docker container for it at the moment. The other two do have got Docker containers, and I highly recommend you go and run those. Um, they're a bit of a faff to set up. Otherwise, Docker container, you literally download, hit the run button, and they're off. So a lot <coughs> easier. One of the things about testing is get permission. Uh, you are attacking a website. If it's your own and it's internal, it's not a problem. If it's your own and there's somebody in the support guy and he gets called out at 3 o'clock in the morning because you're attacking the site, um, and he's coming in for a DDoS, he's not going to be too happy, and she's probably going to be even less so. Um, so make sure you let people know or get permission. And you'll probably invalidate your tests anyway. There is a lot of tools out there from DNS uh, checking. Um, we used to run uh, something on HA proxy that just said if you made too many requests in a certain number of seconds, we just cut you off. So if you don't let people know, you'll probably invalidate your tests anyway. Or maybe that's what you want to test, you know, the fact that you are being spotted and, and caught out. But um, as I say, let them know. And the other one is the uh, AWS. Um, they do have a request form. The link is here, and it will finally come up. They are very hot on blocking malicious traffic or anything they, uh, they consider it. So if you want to test your website and your rest web application on the cloud, then uh, fill in that reform. It gives you full details on that web link there. Um, and they will give you a certain period of time, and you can do what you like with it. So they're very much up on the um, security side of things and getting it tested. So now demo time. This is going to be fun, because I've now got to change um, over screen, so we're going to see how well this works. If I can find the mouse at all. Right, as I said, um, uh, Zap is a jar file, so you literally just download the, uh, the application in, in one tar file and um, unpack it and then just run <coughs> zap.sh. Probably can't see that, let me just increase that. Ooh, and I can't see that either. This is where it starts running on the other screen. Right, one of the things it has, uh, if you can see that on there, uh, the first thing it will do is come up and ask you about sessions. Now, sessions are there to um, record everything you've done. So when you um, save that session, you can go back to it and check all the uh, different vulnerabilities that are on there. Um, you can run without it, so as soon as you close down the UI, you've lost all that information. 
but otherwise it will save all that information into, into the session file for you and you can open that up at a later time. Um, I think I'm probably going to curtail this fairly quickly because I can't see too well. Right, as you see there, um, we've got the, um, the attack browser here. Um, you can literally just type in whichever one you want and um, click the attack and off it will go. It will go and spider the site for you and it will um, then um, follow any links on that side. So one of the things uh, you have to note is it starts up in the far corner there in standard mode. Um, in standard mode, it can do dangerous things. Uh, they left it in standard mode because they wanted people to know that it would actually work out the box. Um, it's one of those things, it's kind of unsafe, but you need to know about it. So if you just want to attack your own site in your own scope, then you, start, you need to start using protected mode. And um, it has, a, um, it has a concept of both uh, a scope and a context. So when you go browsing on here, um, you literally, I'm not going to show you because it's, uh, it's too difficult on the screen, but um, you can go out and do this for yourselves. Um, it, it will come up and find the site. So all you have to do is set the, um, the proxy browser, uh, the proxy setting on your browser to um, 127 local host and then 8080. Um, and as soon as you go into here, uh, Zap is watching that and you'll start seeing all the pages it's gone through um, appearing on the site. So what you then do is add those um, into the new context. So you find your page, add that page into the context and then say that's the defined scope. After that point it will only follow items in that scope. So typically you have uh, JS um, scripts that are coming from Google or elsewhere it will not follow those anymore. So you will not be bugging Google with the same attacks that you're doing on your own website. So very, very important to um, understand the, um, the modes that it's working in um, and also the scopes that you're, you're working to. The, as I mentioned before, what we can do is regression tests. Um, now this is where you get two for one effectively um, because the, um, you should be doing these or if you're not then start considering about it. Uh, effectively what you can do is get, as I say, something like Apache Ant or any other web driver. Your website automatically. So you're going through testing the functionality automatically. You can get through an awful lot of testing there. Um, that goes off and tests your, your web app at the end. But what we can do then is actually do a security regression test at the same time. Because what we'll do is drive Selenium through Zap. So instead of going straight to your app, you're going through Zap. Zap is doing all your security testing for you. So at the same time you're doing your regression tests, you can also be doing the security tests at the same time. So you get two for one, and it shouldn't cost an awful lot more. Uh, on top of that, we can also drive directly from the API. So if you're not using Selenium, you like to do things directly, uh, then that's also possible with the full API there. As I mentioned, it's got a, um, a Jenkins plugin, and uh, that allows all the functions of Zap to be run uh, by the API from Jenkins. Uh, so you can set up your uh, Jenkins scripts in the normal fashion, and then just run um, run Zap automatically from those. 
So it runs the scans, it will save reports in all the ZAP formats, and it will also load and save the sessions, so you can go and revisit those sessions later if there is something of particular interest that you want to get to. Um, around uh, ZAP, uh, there's various tools that have been built up, and one of the, um, one of the ones that's uh, out there now is actually uh, a testing and automation framework. Uh, this is, um, uh, uses ZAP and a few other items uh, in security. SSLIs, which goes and examines your SSL certs and security. Nessus, which is another vulnerability scanning. As I said, ZAP isn't a magic bullet. You need to use other tools. And they actually use Selenium to drive all this. And it was actually written by um, uh, Stephen De Veers, who was uh, one of the co-founders of OWASP and went on to uh, work on uh, this product and several others of his own. Again, it's open source, so you can go in there and have a look at the code and see how it's driven. Um, Co-founder, as I said, and this time I will try and switch to video, which will be fun. On the basis I didn't. I didn't dare try and do this. So what you do is your normal um, continuous deployment pipeline. You make changes to your code as you go along. Um, various, trying to make it unsafe by the looks of it here. Um, and then we would go in and um, book that into uh, GitHub. So we're then uh, submitting our code and GitHub then would use the webhooks and Jenkins will pick up that, uh, those webhooks and will start the build process. Um, it actually builds two sets. So one is your application that it's building and it's also t uh, building the testing framework that's put together with a, a, the language for the uh, BDD. And then that runs, as I said, by Zap, you can see there. This is the um, Selenium that's now driving the website, going through and testing all the different function parts of your site. And it starts bringing up all the different scans, um, an awful lot of them. And at the end of it, uh, you will start getting um, full output from the, the system. Uh, again, as, as per ZAP, it starts bringing out all the different errors and we'll start reporting on them and showing you exact uh, errors, what's happening, why it's happening. Um, another part on there is the fact, uh, because it's being run through Jenkins and Jenkins has got the code from uh, GitHub, then it can actually take you straight to the actual uh, code that uh, has caused that particular problem. So you can go straight back to where the issue is. And this very much shortens you know, the debugging time um, for within your system. <coughs> it also goes through and gives you very detailed reports, what's happened, why it's happened, and even quite a lot about um, how to actually fix, fix the problems on there. Um, As you can see there, fully detailed all the way through, and that's just showing that Bob can see Alice's, uh, Alice's information. Okay, the links are up there. This should already be live up there for you. So it's got all the links that uh, you've seen tonight. Um, uh, the top one is the actual slideshow, uh, but you can get through all the different um, parts and download all those. Um, some more ones there, the, the ancillary ones. And that's it.